All right. Hello, everybody. We are live here at Fertility from the Soul. I get a little nervous every time I hit the go live button because I just don't know what the tech gods are going to have waiting for me. So <laughs> let's do a quick check in. Um, actually, let me just introduce what we're going to be doing here today. If you have questions about getting pregnant naturally over 35 or over 40 or whatever age you're at, really, Go ahead and drop those questions into the chat. Let's make sure that the chat is working here. Uh, let me know where you are logging in from, where are you viewing from. I know we have viewers from all around the world usually, which is really fun. Um, but let's make sure everything is working. I'd like to hear something in the chat to tell me that you can hear me, first of all. Can you hear me? Somebody give me some kind of indicator. Okay, you're hearing me, awesome. <laughs> That's a good start. I've had all of these tech disasters happen in my live stream. <clears throat> Nobody could hear me. My screen fell over on me in one of my live streams. <laughs> that screen back there was behind me and fell on top of me. So who's here? Xenia, chocolate coated life right on Dallas. <laughs> Zenia is in Wisconsin. Hi, Zenia. Stacy Lynn. Hi, Stacy in San Francisco. Virginie, Ali and Magda, uh, Alessia from Yosha. Oh my goodness, so many people here. Is it possible to watch this later? Yes, this will be on replay. It just depends sometimes how long it takes for YouTube to process it. But I'm hoping we'll be on here for about half an hour and then it'll go into replay mode. So check back uh, maybe an hour or two later to see the replay. Hi, Eugenia. Uh, so good to see everybody here. Italy, Sweden, wonderful. Okay, so let me introduce myself real quick for those who are not familiar with me and uh, what I'm doing here on, on YouTube and online with uh, fertility support. My name is Dr. Natalie Masson. I'm a psychologist. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, as a psychologist, I specialize in the mind-body connection. So you might be wondering, what does psychology have to do with fertility? Or maybe you're thinking, I know what psychology has to do with fertility. <laughs> so let me just give a quick overview. Uh, the way we think and feel affects our physical bodies as well. So that's the most direct reason why psychology has a place in the fertility realm. So there are studies that show that when we're more stressed out, we're less likely to conceive. There are many more connections between the mind and body and how the way that we're thinking and feeling can affect your fertility. But that's just one example. Uh, the other reason is our emotional health, our emotional well-being, our quality of life matters. So it's not just about can we conceive, can we have a baby and all that. It's how are we doing in life? What's our quality of life? Are we enjoying this process? Are we miserable all the way there? These things matter. To me, it's not just about um, do we get the actual outcome we were hoping for, but how are we feeling on the way there? So I'm looking at all these things. In other pieces, how are our relationships? So much of fertility talk is about um, the female side and what we're doing to support this. But uh, the majority of us who are on this path, not everybody, are trying to do this with another person. And that person is a significant individual in our lives. And how is that part of the story? And how are we taking care of that? How does that fit in to our fertility and our quality of life? This piece, I think, often gets ignored in the, in the quest to, um, to create new life. And it's not insignificant. So there are a lot of elements that, as a psychologist, I bring into the picture that I think tend to get left out. There are a lot of elements that are not going to be my specialty, the very medical stuff. But what I can do is I try to stay aware of what's going on so that I can point you in the directions where you might be able to get reliable um, help and more support in those directions. So I don't try to uh, be a medical doctor and learn everything about autoimmune conditions and thyroid conditions and all these things. But I do keep my ears open, stay aware of where the resources are, where you might get support around those more specific things. Okay, so the plan for today is, um, first of all, I want you to know that 
There is a program that I'm running next week that is open for enrollment right now. That's called the seven day TTC chill out challenge. I first did this in September of last year and it was so successful that I've just been running it again and again. This is the sixth time we're going to be going through it. And that is open for enrollment now through Saturday, May 16th. If you're watching this on replay and you missed that window, just sign up for the wait list. We're going to do it again. About every two months is when we do it. I'm not going to elaborate on it right now because I want to get to the questions about uh, getting pregnant naturally that I wanted to answer today, but I'll talk about that program at the end. And if you have questions, please ask those questions and I'll make sure I do I'll do my best to answer everything. Sometimes it's hard for me to keep up with what's in the chat. So if you ask something and I didn't get to it, I'm not ignoring you. I just have a hard time splitting my attention. But uh, you'll see in the description below, I have a private Facebook group called Getting Pregnant Naturally. And you can join that Facebook group and ask questions there as well if I didn't get to your question here. But I will try to. I'll pause and read the questions so that I can uh, do my best to get to those questions live. Okay, so more about that program later, but uh, the main thing I want to focus on today is that uh, about two weeks ago, I, I had an idea and I did a, a quick video here saying that I wanted to do, um, I, I did a bunch of polls in my community tab. If you're not aware, there's a community tab on my channel and sometimes you can see little posts. They're kind of like little Facebook posts um, that will come to you. And I did a bunch of polls to ask, what people want to know about, uh, what, what topics people most want to know about. And we kind of narrowed it down to how to get pregnant uh, over 35 and over 40. Um, and so then I went in my Facebook group and I posted, what are the things that you would like to know about this? So I wanted to make a video series addressing all these different questions. Questions, and I thought, I'm just going to pop out this video series. I'll recordings for about an hour or two, split it up into bite-sized pieces and publish those. And I haven't gotten past making a list of all the topics that I want to cover because life has been so busy. Um, I don't know about all of you, who's just sitting around watching Netflix all night and who feels like they're busier than ever? <laughs> I'm busier than ever because I'm doing this online program and now the kids are home and I'm trying to do homeschooling and and be as uh, responsible as a mother <laughs> as I can be. So I'm busier than ever. So sometimes I come up with these ideas that I can't quite follow through with in the timeline that I was hoping. So I have not made that series of 10 videos that are bite-sized. And I felt like all those questions were sitting there waiting for me to answer. So I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna come on live and answer these questions right here. So I've got a list of about 12 questions that people have asked. I've grouped them together by category. And I'm just gonna go through and share with you my thought process, how I think about these questions. And I hope that will be helpful for you. For me, what's so important is I really want people to be empowered and knowledgeable and have an understanding of a range of perspectives on these questions. So often the medical model is considered the primary source, and I consider it one very good source, but it's one of many sources. So I try to expand your awareness so that you can be aware of a variety of ways to think about things and to approach things for yourself and find what works best for you. I'm going to pause for a moment to breathe. Those who have been following me uh, for a long time know that um, breathing is sort of central to how I teach people to access their inner calm and centeredness. So I encourage you in this moment, while you're not under pressure and you're just passively watching, notice your breathing. Let your breath flow in and out naturally. I don't teach a really specific controlled style of breathing. It's more of a letting go and being aware and tuning in. So I'm going to do that right now just a little bit because I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm a little bit charged up, you know, on the spot, been running around this morning. And to be honest with you, I was checking my uh, emails right before we started and some just really incredible stuff was coming in from somebody in one of my, who'd been in my program for a long time, who kind of disappeared, who was sharing with me that she just got her second um, ultrasound. She's pregnant, I didn't know that. And I'm so excited for her. And I got a bunch of other good news from people in my programs coming in and people signing up for the uh, seven day challenge. So it's like, I got all these things coming at me and then getting ready to focus for this. So I'm a little bit, whew, I'm just gonna <laughs> chill myself out. 
recognize that all these balls are flying in the air and it's okay. In this moment, we're just here right now. I'm here with 34 of you right now all around the world. I, I'm just really excited <laughs> about everything that's going on, all the possibilities and having this opportunity to connect with all of you. Okay, so let me just peek in the chat to see um, <clears throat> if any questions are coming up that I want to flag. Scotland, India, Atlanta. Zeynep's been following me since September. Yeah, the first chill out challenge in September. Uh, we had a big group in there and we've been doing it ever since. Zinnia. And it, I've kept most of the content the same, but we I keep refining it. And, you know, every time we go through it, it's really a different experience because of who it shows up and what's going on in the world. So if you've done it before, it's still a novel experience to do it again because so much uh, changes, even though the the meditations themselves don't change. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any questions coming up. So I'm going to dive right into the questions that came up in uh, my private Facebook group. Uh, so the topic was getting pregnant over 35 or 40. What are the things that you would like me to answer for you? Okay. So the first set of questions have to do with age specifically. And this one's from Suzanne. I'm wondering how about how the partner's age might impact things and if it's just as important for the partner to work on mindset and lifestyle. In my case, I'll be 44 this year and my husband is 52. I see a lot of women in different Facebook groups getting pregnant with younger partners. Is it more difficult if both are at a more ma mature age? I like that framing, mature age. So, uh, Suzanne, I, what I would say to that is um, I always encourage people to think about both sides of the equation. And I hear this often from doctors who specialize in um, men's treatment, like urologists. And they often say half of conception is the sperm, which literally it is. There's the egg and there's the sperm and they both contribute. So anything that um, anything that affects sperm health is relevant as well. And it doesn't get as much airplay, but I've heard many cases where it was assumed that it was the woman's issue for years. And then after much more exploration, it was found that all that time it was the man's issue. Maybe they were doing IVF and very expensive um, taxing procedures with while they're missing the picture. So I do encourage people to focus, couples to focus on both sides. Um, does age affect men's fertility? Yes, it does. You know, men have a much longer potential window than women do, but age can also affect sperm quality. And Mindset and lifestyle, do those make a difference? As far as what I understand, yes. And I really like um, this source. It's not my specialty, men's fertility. But when I've been poking around, I came across a website that I really liked. It's called um, maleinfertilityguide.com. And it's hosted by a urologist who specializes in male, infer male fertility. And he has a lot on his website about lifestyle. In fact, he runs something called the Sperm Boot Camp. And um, I don't know anybody who's gone through that, but it really emphasizes a lot of these lifestyle factors, how you eat, you know, alcohol, exercise, sleep, all these things that we also work on for female fertility. If you can partner with your significant other and do these lifestyle changes together, it's a win, win, win. You know, it's good for our health and longevity in general. It's good for your fertility. It's good for your relationship if you're doing something healthy together. Mm -hmm. And um, so we also have to be careful about, this is a relationship issue, couples issue of how we invite or influence their significant other to get on the health wagon or get on the fertility wagon with us. So 
that is a couple's communication type issue. And um, that's something that I kind of work on in my programs is how do we connect with each other and not have the whole thing become stressful or, or aversive, but a relationship enhancing experience. Okay. And then Alexis asks, what are the biggest risks of conceiving after 35 than after 40? So this is the kind of question that if I were going to make a specific video about this, I'd probably go down the rabbit hole for about six hours pulling together all the information because I want to give a fully responsible answer to the question. I haven't done that, but I can just tell you in general, um, there are some things that uh, women during pregnancy have a higher risk of um, preeclampsia related to blood pressure, things like that. There are a handful of things that could be a higher risk. And what I encourage you to look at when you do this research, if you're inclined to say, okay, how risky is this at my age, is to actually look at, how, instead of just the laundry list of horrible things that might happen to you or your baby, look at how likely is that, or what, what percentage of women have been found to experience things like that due to age? And how much are these things influenced by our health? So maybe if you have high blood pressure already, you have, if you have certain conditions, then things are more likely. But maybe if you're very healthy to start with, you're really quite a bit less likely to have a complication. And there are plenty of women in their mid 40s who go through pregnancy without any complication at all. I see this on forums oftentimes. It's just an impression that, oh, if you're over 40, certainly you're going to have a disastrous pregnancy. And that's just not true. There are a lot of completely uncomplicated pregnancies. I had mine, at, my two at 42 and 46, and there were no complications in my pregnancies at all. So I don't like people to assume, but you can find out what some of the things are that uh, could have the pregnancy be something that needs to be a little bit wa more watched and monitored. Um, even things like th there's a lot of talk about, oh, if you go all the way to 40 weeks or beyond, the placenta might break down and lead to a failed pregnancy. And so there's a lot of encouragement to induce early for women who are over a certain age um, but you can also have that monitored, which is what I did when I was 46 and I was going past my due date. I had um, ultrasounds done where they could look and see the quality of my placenta. And at 41 weeks, it was not breaking down. And in fact, it was so healthy that my doula after the birth said, can I take your placenta to show to my students what a healthy placenta looks like? And that was me delivery at 46. So I just don't, I, I want people to be aware that there are some things that can be affected, but just because it affects some people doesn't mean that everybody is on uh, on a train to disaster because they were past a certain age when they were uh, pregnant. The other risk that I think it's important to talk about and acknowledge is the risk of chromosomal abnormalities. This is probably, I'm going to guess, the thing that impacts of all the different things that age can impact in getting pregnant and carrying a pregnancy, probably the increase in egg quality issues, chromosomal abnormalities that could lead to um, an, uh, an embryo not developing properly, which usually leads to miscarriage. There are some conditions like Down syndrome where um, babies can survive and, and live with that, but there are many, uh, chromosomal abnormalities that will lead to a pregnancy um, ending on its own, usually in the first trimester. So this does go up, particularly after 40. And this is the focus of one of my programs called the 90 day egg nurturing program, where research indicates that it's not just a downward slide. Yes, it's more common as we get older. But if we can take care of our overall health and our energy levels, there's there is um, there is some reasonable evidence that we can reduce the chances of having these chromosomally abnormal eggs. And I know that is something that has not been assumed to be true in, uh, in the medical community until maybe more recently. Um, but when I was going through my miscarriages, um, 
five years ago, that was not the prevalent model, but that book, It Starts With the Egg, did come out right around that time. And since that book came out, people are more and more aware of the possibility that we can do things to improve our egg quality. And if you know my story, that's I didn't follow that book. I hadn't read that book till afterwards, but I followed the premise that improving my health for three months before ovulation might give me a better chance at having um, a, a chromosomally normal egg uh, during conception. And that is what happened for me. So I had two miscarriages due to abnormal eggs. I was 45 years old. I took off three months to work on my egg quality and I got pregnant the next month and it was a chromosomally normal egg. And my daughter's four years old. Now, if you watch my last live stream, she actually walked in on it. I have a, uh, an in-house babysitter this time, my husband. <laughs> I've locked my door, so that won't be happening. But just to say that we... While this is, I think, probably the bigger of all the different age issues, there's also this possibility that it's not completely out of our control. It's not only related to age. It's probably a combination of age and lifestyle factors. And that's where I focus a lot of my energy is on helping women. We can't turn back age, right? That It is what it is. But what can we focus on to improve our chances as much as possible? Okay, so those are some of my thoughts about risks of conceiving after 35, then 40. Going on to, I'm gonna check the comments to see if questions are coming up in relation to any of this. I know I'm covering a lot of content. So if your husband believes he is a superman with super sperm, that can help. <laughs> okay, that, that's a question. Um, to the extent that having optimism and a positive attitude can improve your energy, I suppose that we could connect the dots and say that might help. Okay. Um, chocolate coated life, age 43, pregnant twice and in a miscarriages, not currently trying to conceive. Should I continue to take ubiquitol for egg quality and then TTC later? Okay, great question. So this is exactly the topic I'm talking about. Things that might help improve egg quality, ubiquinol is a form of CoQ10, which has been seen in many health conditions, heart disease for one, uh, many other conditions. They've been studying this for quite a while. It's been seen to improve mitochondrial functioning and improve a lot of different health conditions. And they've really looked at it a lot in older populations like heart disease, 50 and older. And it's also been um, cited in fertility as something that might help with egg quality. And when I looked across all these areas, it really did seem like ubiquinol was getting a lot of uh, thumbs up in different health areas. And to me, that's kind of an argument that there's something overall that it's doing to, in a sense, reverse or buy back a few years of our vitality. So that is one supplement that sounds to me like it could be um, helpful. There are so many supplements that people take and entertain taking. And I think a lot of them just don't have enough research to let us know if it's worth it or not. You just don't know if you're dumping all your money down the drain or maybe something's not helpful. But ubiquitol, I've seen so much convergent evidence from many areas that it sort of uh, can buy you back I don't know, maybe five or 10 years in your, um, in the kind of the, where, where you are in a lot of the aging process. Um, and so should I continue to take ubiquinol for egg quality when I TTC later? So the piece to keep in mind here is if our theory is right, that we can influence egg quality, the theory says that it's like three to six months, maybe even a year before that egg is ovulated, that it's going through development and that what you do can make a difference. So if you think you're totally done with trying to conceive, then you might let it go. But if you think you might want to try again in three months, six months or a year, it might not be a bad idea to continue that and all the other things that you might be doing to take care of yourself, decrease stress, sleep a lot, all the self-care. Think of that as preconception preparation to reduce the chance of miscarriage. So if you got pregnant twice, um, that means that you're, everything is working, but most likely 
it's egg quality. There are a few other things that can cause miscarriage too, but if it's egg quality and you think you might want to try again, I would really encourage you to uh, invest in these things that are going to potentially help with egg quality. And the good news is all of those things are good for your health anyway. They're good for your health, your vitality, your mental health. So it's really kind of a no brainer. I, I follow my 90 day egg nurturing lifestyle, I'm not trying to get pregnant, but now it's about longevity. It's about having the best quality of life uh, and, and thus longevity uh, moving forward here. My kids are young. I want to be around to see their, their kids. Um, so I guess my answer is yes. I think there's an argument to consider ubiquinol. And again, I don't, I'm not going to consider myself a supplement expert. Um, look that stuff up, the people who are really going through the research and what they're seeing. But what, from what I've seen, when I look at those sources, ubiquinol seems to be um, one of the more less controversial ones. Mentally and making you feel hopeless. Okay. Um, that is the next question on my list. So I'm going to read that question. I'll be answering yours too. Suzanne asked, uh, she said, I'm looking for advice on how to avoid being affected by negativity around age and fertility. For example, if someone posts a question in any of the 40 plus pregnancy groups about their chances, many women answer with stories about rainbow babies, but there is also rainbow baby for those who aren't familiar is what is the term we use for after you've had a miscarriage, a baby that comes after that is a rainbow baby. So many women answer with stories about rainbow babies, but there's also one or two who feel very strongly about that these lucky women are an exception. With a negativity bias, it's difficult not to put attention on the negative stories. So we actually, Suzanne and I actually, Suzanne and I actually went back and forth chatting a little bit about this in the Facebook thread. And um, it's exactly related to what Melinda's asking. How do you not... Uh, make you feel hopeless. Um, actually, no, Melinda's question is related to the next section I'm going to get to. So let me answer Su Suzanne's question here, and then I'm going to talk about the statistics. In terms of just this negativity bias and people around you saying things that might bring you down and take your hope away, I actually have a pretty strong opinion about this. I think that we absorb the energy of those around us. That could be somebody in your physical space. That could be somebody in the in cyberspace posting in a forum. We absorb that. We can't be exposed to it without taking something in from that. So I'm actually a big proponent of protecting your energetic space and making careful choices about what you expose yourself to. So if you're on the over 40 pregnancy forum and somebody posts a prompt that says, uh, what do you think, what, what are the chances of getting pregnant after 40? You can know before you even open up that thread, what's likely to be in there. You know, 90% encouraging posts and then a few Debbie Downers. Do you want to read that? So if you know where that's going and how that's gonna affect you, I say move on. If you're in a forum where there tends to be a lot of stuff that triggers negativity for you, I'd say leave that forum. And that's actually what Suzanne ended up doing <laughs> as we were chatting in that search. You know, I just kind of decided to leave a few forums. Notice how you feel because frankly, any of these things are true. Yes, it's possible. Yes, there can be problems. What do you want to be focusing on? How is it helpful to, for you to focus on the negative parts? I say it's important to be aware of all the parts so that you can make a decision. But once you've decided where you're headed with this, you don't need to keep chewing on the negative parts. Focus on the parts that are going to give you the best chance. And the best chance in this game is staying hopeful, staying optimistic, and focusing on what you can do that's positive for yourself. So I really encourage people to find environments, find communities where people are not focusing on the negative. And sometimes that means staying away from fertility forums altogether. Sometimes that means finding those where the culture is one of hopefulness and optimism. And that's actually been a huge element of what I've been creating over the last year and a half in my online programs 
is I wanted to have that community for people to come to where they could feel hopeful and positive, be aware, not stick our heads in the sand. We don't have to harp on that. We don't have to get so down about that. Um, you know, and one of the, and because when I, when I was going through my own challenges, I did rely a lot on online support, uh, online forums. And it was difficult sometimes because I was sort of, I felt like a lone wolf in this sea of women over 40 who didn't believe in their bodies, who believed that they had to use interventions. They believed that it was all doom and gloom. And there was, you know, so, but they were the only women I could talk to. So I'd try to create my own threads and say, hey, who wants to work on egg health with me? And we'd chat about that. I had to put blinders on a little bit <clears throat> to filter out all the, the self-doubting uh, and, and, and pessimism. And so when I was going through that, I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to have commu a community where people were coming together from this more positive space? And it could almost make me cry right now, but I feel like I'm creating that community. And <clears throat> the women in my programs are like just so incredible. And I have a lot of hoops that you have to kind of jump through <laughs> to get into my more close knit communities. And it's probably not the best thing for growing a large business, but it's the thing that speaks to me because if you get into my programs, it's because you went through the seven day challenge. It's because you went through four more weeks of practices after that and conceive with ease. That's my membership. And if you get into the 90 day egg nurturing program, it's because you went through five weeks of meditations with me and you know what it means to be in non-judgment, to be compassionate, to be um, validating to be accepting, you know, like a lot of Zen principles I bring in. So by the time we get down to talking about the nitty gritty, everybody's coming together from this really well grounded place. And I just, I just love that. I love that it's taken time, but I've created this kind of community. But that's my recommendation uh, to people like Suzanne, where you're feeling like, oh, it's hard to filter all this out. Stay away from threads, from forums from communities where there's a lot of negativity and find those that are in alignment with being hopeful, being realistic, but hopeful. That's kind of my balance. It's not, oh, if you just think positive enough, it's all gonna happen for you. I don't believe that either. What I believe is building up a resilience so that we can handle and thrive no matter which direction things go and building up our determination and our optimism so that we can use all of our energy toward giving ourselves the best chance. So that is the culture that I am fostering in my, in my communities. Um, and you can find that, um, you know, in my free Facebook group, that's the direction we're going, but in my uh, membership program, we get to go even deeper with that. Um, and you'll sense that on my YouTube channel as well. Okay, I'm gonna pause take a breath and look at questions here. Lots of activity here. Um, somebody's asking, is it possible to use PayPal instead of providing my credit card details? It doesn't seem secure. Um, I believe it's pretty secure. I use a teachable platform, which is a online course platform that's used around the world. And I haven't heard of people having problems, but if you're having a big issue with that, email me and we can see if there's a way to work something out with PayPal. I'm not set up to take PayPal through that system, but maybe I can work something out for you. So just um, email me if you're having big concerns about that. Uh, and then I'm for three, what can I do to conceive naturally? I don't want to do IVF. Okay. Um, I can't answer that in a nutshell, but still, stick with me. And if you stick with my programs and if you stick with my meditations, that's really what I'm, um, I'm really helping to hope those who are 43 and want to go for this conceiving naturally. And I would also say that once we get toward our mid forties, there's not really a lot of evidence that um, interventions are necessarily more effective than trying to conceive naturally. So if you're feeling like you don't want to do IVF, I still I do believe that there's a lot that we can do to improve our chances. Um, but I go into that in a lot more depth in my programs. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to hold back information in answering that question very briefly, but um, you know, in a nutshell, it's becoming as knowledgeable as possible about your 
your your cycle, increasing your health, decreasing your stress, following up on any medical conditions that might be impacting things, things like thyroid conditions. It's really empowering yourself with understanding how to bring your body into the best alignment possible and then making sure you understand things like when's your fertile window. I had somebody message me the other day who was in her mid 40s and trying to do this and she did not know when she ovulates and she said, I think I should be trying to have intercourse uh, around ovulation time. So like days 15, 16 and 17 and she had a very short menstrual cycle which means that she was almost certainly ovulating much earlier than day 14. And I was like, face palm, oh my gosh, you might be, have been trying for many cycles and you completely missed your ovulation. So I have a guide called the TTC Essentials Guide. I want everybody to know the basics of timing things and charting your cycle. Um, so you want one of the basics and then you want to get down to the more specific things to your condition if there are medical issues that need to be addressed. And then a lot of what I work on in my programs is healthy living stuff, which it's easier said than done. Uh, but there's so much that we can do to improve our health physically and emotionally. And I think the emotional stuff really plays an impact too. Okay, Janine. Oh, and uh, Golden Pink Diamond's message retracted. Okay, I'm going to check and see if you put another message because, okay, here it is. How do I not overly stress about certain plastics, canned foods, things that are in, it starts with the egg. Okay, this question came up in my last live stream and I didn't see it until after I had ended it and I wasn't able to answer your question. So I'm so glad you came back and answer, asked again. Um, so this is kind of cool. If you've read the book, it starts with the egg. Uh, Rebecca Fett lays out the theory of why it matters what we do in the months before conception. And then she hits a bunch of categories that she's looked into that might impact egg quality. One of them is exposure to toxins. So toxins are in all kinds of man-made products that are in our plastics, that are in our cosmetics, all these things. And when I read through that, I think the toxins was the first thing that she focused on. And then there was some uh, nutrition things and supplements, stuff like that. But it was the first thing that she focused on. and. Once you go down the rabbit hole and start figuring out what is in your environment that could have toxins in it, it turns out it's like pretty much everything. And you say, well, I'm gonna eliminate this stuff. And it turns out it's impossible to stay completely clear of these things from the receipts you touch at the grocery store to uh, containers that you buy food in. And I thought, wow, you know, this could be really stressful. And now we're working in the opposite direction where we have so much stress mm -hmm about coming into contact with toxins that the stress itself could be bad for egg quality and for fertility. So when I read through that book a couple years ago, I was like, uh, I don't know how much in alignment I am with this. Um, so I kind of hold that stuff lightly. But the cool thing is just a few months ago, maybe a year ago, actually, uh, Rebecca Fett did an interview on a podcast called Beat Infertility. And she was talking about revisions for her, the second edition of the book. So she had just come out with the second edition and she was doing her tour, sharing what it was, what, what was new in there. And one of the things that she said was based on the feedback she got from people who had read the book, she felt like that piece got overemphasized and people were driving themselves nuts with trying to avoid toxins. And so in the second edition, she tried to dial it back. I have not read the second edition, but this is just her commentary about it. She wanted to help people be more realistic. And so she clarified which things she thought were more important and which things might be, you know, okay, just let that go. Like you buy your yogurt and it comes in a plastic container, don't worry about that. So she kind of sorted through how to prioritize. Um, but I was really happy and relieved to hear that because I just think that it's not realistic to be um, perfectionistic about that, about just about anything, actually. <laughs> Perfectionism is the entryway to uptightness and stress, and that's not good for any of the things we're, we're wanting to work on. So I was really happy that she kind of addressed this directly. I don't know if it's addressed directly like that in the book, but that was her intention was to get people off the perfectionism train and not have them freaking out about freaking out about everything they're touching and eating. So let me see if that answers that. So 
how do I not overly stress about certain classics campaigns? Okay, so I would suggest that make sure you've read the second edition of the book, came out last year um, to see exactly what she says and just and maybe listen to that podcast interview as well. Just Google uh, Beat Infertility Podcast. It starts with the egg. You'll find that episode and listen to what she has to say. So you'll hear it from the author, her revised perspective on how stressed out you should be about it. And I think that will calm your nerves about that. Okay, I'm gonna come back to Janine Brown. Um, we had our first failed IVF cycle in February, I'm sorry. And about to start our second cycle, we're currently taking in folic, impril, what else can we do to improve? Okay, so I'm, I, are those supplements that you're taking? Um, so the things that you can do to improve, okay, stepping in just a little bit out of my lane here because I usually don't address um, medical interventions, the IVF cycle stuff, but since you asked, I'll give you my general impressions. If you're doing an IVF cycle, um, once you're in that cycle, I would recommend relaxing as much as you can, especially uh, after transfer. I, I, I have a feeling that the body is sort of uh, in, in real time deciding whether it's ready to receive the implantation and the more that you can do to dial down the stress, the better. And I can only imagine, I never went through IVF myself, but I can only imagine how much going through a procedure like this just ramps up the stress levels. So it's a tricky thing to manage, but if you can work with yourself, use all the tools you have, develop tools on the way to starting your IVF cycle for uh, self-calming so you can stay as chill as possible during those uh, during those critical weeks. But the um, in terms of pre preparing uh, for your best success, a lot of that also has what we were talking about with egg quality. And when you're talking about things you take, I think the things you take, my impression is that they're not necessarily, the, the bigger impact of the things that you take like supplements would be to help your egg quality. And that has to be in the months before ovulation. So we need to look at a wide window. And if your cycle is in June and it's mid-May right now, I'm sorry to say there's nothing you can do from my understanding to help your egg quality for the June cycle. But what you do now can help for your August cycle. And maybe you'll do another round of IVF if that one didn't work, or maybe you'll be trying naturally. So I always encourage people to just stretch out that window, stop thinking about the next month and the next the next one, but think three months out. I know it's hard to do because you don't want to think that you're going to not have success between now and three to six months. But if you can shift that mindset to where you're thinking about how you're nurturing the eggs for months to come, that can, if you can look at that as a positive thing, that everything you're doing now is nurturing the next 10 eggs that are coming, that can help you feel more optimistic about what's coming if you have a cycle that doesn't work out. So there's a lot of protective things about looking at that longer longer window. Um, is it wrong combining your different YouTube videos? Oh no, combining them? Oh, mix and match, however you feel like it's helpful to you. I have a lot of videos now and I do have a program that I just created and the first 300 people have gone through or in the process of going through. It's called the 10 day. It, it's called the fertile, fertile mindset, 10 day immersion program. And what I did was I kind of curated all of the videos, meditations that I have on my YouTube channel and lined them up to be released over 10 days and wove in and out of that my personal story and my story of how I created the meditations to put them in a context. So it's not just like a list. Here's meditations to choose from. It tells a story and it helps you understand how and when to use the different meditations. And the feedback has been really positive, even for people who have listened to them all before going through in this 10 day series seem to kind of open things up on a new level. So I'm super excited about that. You can, um, 
sign up for the wait list for that. I'm putting that on hold while we're doing the seven day challenge. So we're doing the seven day program starting next Monday and I didn't want people overlapping. So I put that program on hold, but that's gonna open up again once we're done with the second day challenge for anybody that missed that this time through. So um, I will be adding links to all those things in the comments below, but you can also find that in my Facebook group and most of it's also on my website. Okay, where are we? So no, it's not wrong to combine the different videos. It's helpful if you understand what each one is designed for and that can help you figure out how you wanna layer them together. Okay, and if anybody has done these programs, who's watching has done some of these programs, the seven day challenge, the 10 day mindset immersion, go ahead and drop a comment so others can hear about your experience. Um, Stacy Lynn, you've set a lovely and positive tone. Thank you, you're welcome. I'm so happy to be able to do that. Um, I'm, I wanna conceive naturally, but does your program align with IUI? You know what, any, Thing that you're going to do to that that involve where you would benefit from being in a healthy alignment and from improving your egg quality is going to be helpful for whatever you're going to do. So in my programs, I keep the focus on natural conception because I really want to stay in my own lane for the things that I've experienced and I understand well. All that other stuff I encourage people to uh, be empowered about what the different options are. And my members learn a lot from each other because a lot of them have been through all of these procedures and can educate each other. Um, so there's a lot of resources in my program kind of informally for people to learn about those things, but I don't teach those. However, everything that I do teach is stuff that's going to be beneficial if you're going down that path. So if you're gonna do IUI, you want to be in your best alignment. You want to be able to decrease stress while you're waiting for your, uh, you know, for implantation and all those things. So everything, you know, if you're, um, you know, we have we have women in the program who are are doing this solo, um, focusing on getting pregnant naturally. Obviously, that's not. You need to have some intervention if you're doing this solo. And while I haven't developed. Uh, specific protocols and supports for all the different situations people might be entertaining, all the tools can be applied. So I do want people to know going into my programs that the focus is going to be on getting pregnant naturally, but you can absolutely pull out the pieces that are relevant to your situation. And my not emphasizing those things isn't to discount or discourage them. It's just to make sure that I'm doing, putting as much um, energy and focus as I can into the place where I feel like I can have the most impact. Okay, Hacintha, I find this place very positive and encouraging. Happy to hear that. And I think I recognize your name. I think you're signed up for the seven day challenge. Can people just drop in? a note if they have signed up for the challenge so I know that who's here. I see the names coming up and honestly, I get excited when I see each name because I know from experience that you're gonna have an amazing week next week and things are gonna change for you in ways that you would not have even anticipated. It sounds a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, you know, butterflies and unicorns and stuff, but I'm telling you, it's pretty amazing what can happen in this little seven day program. It's only like a 15 to 20 minute commitment per day. And if you want to take a chance with it, you never know what's going to, what's going to lie ahead. But when I see the names come up, I'm like, oh, so-and-so is going to have an experience next week. And we're going to discover what that is. It's kind of like a little Christmas thing where you don't know what's in those packages, but there's going to be something cool. Okay. We've been trying for almost a year and I have been told that my weight will not allow me to be pregnant. Plus my couple has a very small partner has. Okay. So you think you might have, um, there might be sperm issues and weight issues. So um, I like to think of 
this process of trying to conceive and get anything in alignment as sometimes it's a motivation and a, a call to us to find our best way of taking care of ourselves and our optimal health. And so I would look at this as a motivation and an opportunity to find your best health. I wouldn't necessarily focus on weight in particular, but what will your weight be when you're living your healthiest lifestyle? And if you have concerns about your partner's um, uh, fertility and sperm, that's something I would definitely recommend following up with testing to see what's actually going on. Okay, Zizana says the 10-day program was absolutely amazing. Thank you for all your feedback, Zizana. She did an amazing job of keeping a journal of her 10 days of experience, and it was really cool to see that. I've been... Um, I was so excited to get up every morning to see what's in store for us. Yeah. Virginie currently doing the 10 day program and has already brought back, brought back positive thinking and a new hope for the future. Sometimes we get lost in here in this process. We forget that we can be, we can be positive. We can feel lighter. So I love that these programs help you come back to that. I've done this. Uh, Kumi says I've done the seven day challenge in March and I felt it made me much calmer. Wonderful. Uh, Judith, I've signed up and I can't wait. Okay, I, I, I'm never going to get done if I keep reading all the, <laughs> reading every comment here. I'm going to have to jump through a little bit because there are a few more questions I want to ask answer. Okay, the next section I want to answer is statistics and hormones. I'm going to read three questions that came up in the Facebook group post, and I'm going to answer them all together. Tara says, is it still possible to get pregnant with a healthy egg with low AMH? I had a healthy baby girl at 37, then two miscarriages at 41. I'm very sorry for your losses. Uh, I've been there, two miscarriages myself. And then I got pregnant with very low AMH. So short answer, it is possible. And I'm going to share a link to a study that showed, um, they looked at 700 women AMH, some had AMH below 0.7 and some were above and they followed them across a year to look at the chances uh, they would get pregnant or how many got pregnant. There was no statistical difference between those who had low AMH, AMH and those who had high AMH, higher AMH. That, is, um, that was done in 2017. And at that time, it was the largest study to date of these factors and these hormones and getting pregnant naturally. So what I want to much of the research is done on getting pregnant. So there's a lot more research around how does AMH predict outcomes. And AMH is a good predictor of how likely you are to be able to do a successful egg retrieval. So if you have low AMH, you're less likely to get good eggs. It doesn't mean you won't. Some people do. But that's the research show us. The research isn't done very much on getting pregnant naturally because there's no money in that. I hate to say it, but money makes the world go around. It makes the research go around. There's not a lot of money in discovering what predicts natural pregnancy because who gets paid for that? Nobody. You save a lot of money for that, but nobody's getting paid. So not a lot of motivation to do that research, but I will add this link when I afterwards when I go back so that you can see that study. They did the same thing for FSH. FSH is another hormone marker that if it's considered, if it's high, which tends to happen when you get older, they think that's not a good predictor. In this study of 700 women, those with FSH above 10 uh, compared to those with FSH below 10 got pregnant at pretty much the same rate over 12 months. And this is for women age, I think it was age 30 to 40 something. I, I can't remember the details. So I don't know, that was pretty stunning to me because these are considered hallmark markers of your egg reserve, of your ovarian re reserve, of your fertility. And I don't know, I had high FSH in some of my tests and very low AMH many times. And I tested several times. It was below, below it was well below one. 0.07, and right before I had my successful pregnancy, it was 0 0.099, very low, wasn't a predictor. I once had an FSH of 33. Other times it was around 12, maybe 10. I think one time it was seven. So it bounced around, um, but that was not a predictor of me being able to get pregnant. 
Marie asks, low MH and the probability of getting pregnant with it, percentage of getting pregnant is very low above 40, but some women still succeed. Why? If it's not happening, what's the process of giving up and potentially accepting the donor egg route? How do I, uh, how to know if hopes are false and impossible is impossible? Okay, so I already addressed the AMH thing. This is a great question though. How do you know when, okay, maybe you can beat the odds or maybe it really is time to say, this is time. And this is not an easy question to answer. I don't think the statistics are a great way to decide because if you want to consider that a lot of the statistics are not based on people taking the best care of themselves and doing all that they can do, I just don't think the statistics are all that relevant. But at some point, I think it's really an intuitive decision of saying, you know, my personal approach is I would wanna give it my best shot do everything that I could in my control over a good period of time. And I would find more peace knowing that I tried everything that I could. And then if I still wanted to be a mother, I would look into the different range of options that could include, you know, I was always interested in adopting, particularly adopting an older child. Um, we didn't end up doing that because we ended up having our second child and we were complete. Uh, others would consider um, egg, don egg donation, embryo donation. So I just think it's a very intuitive process of finding what's right for you. And some people make a decision to say, okay, I'm going to do such and such. And then they get ready to do it. And they feel something inside that says, no, it's not time for me to do that. So I think it's a process of doing these kinds of practices that we teach, that I teach in these programs of coming into connection with your intuitive knowing yourself to find your inner guidance, because nobody can really tell you what is the best choice for you, but you want to feel like you did everything that you could to find peace in yourself and know that you went on a path that was um, that, that felt like honored honored your 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 wishes and your style and your hopes and dreams. So I don't really write it into the language of my programs because it's hard to find out how to talk about it. But whereas most fertility programs, the only thing they're focusing on is you get a successful pregnancy or you don't, there's a bigger picture that is baked in to how I'm running things. I want people to come away feeling like they're just as healthy if they got this outcome as if they got that outcome. Looking at the whole person, the whole picture, how this fits into your life, not just did I get this thing or did I not get this thing? So if you're in my programs, um, you're learning those skills of being able to thrive and find peace in yourself, regardless of where exactly the path leads. Okay, Alexis asks, which hormones are most important and which ones give the most information about the likelihood of conception? Okay, so this relates to the rest of the questions that I just answered, which is a partial answer is, be careful about how you interpret those numbers, but the common ones are the ones that you do on cycle day three, FSH, LH, estradiol, and then there's the AMH, which is really questionable what it's exactly predicting. So there are a handful of hormones. You might check your progesterone seven days after ovulation, but they're not really good predictors, I think, of getting likelihood of getting pregnant naturally. So I take all those with a grain of salt. I had several questions on what to do when your cycle isn't regular and the right length. Ideally, it's about 28 days, 25 to 28 days, ovulations around day 16. But what happens when that's not happening? So Millie asks, is there a natural way to make my luteal phase longer or mine is too short? I'm getting my period soon after ovulation. Shanna says, how to conceive with the irregular cycle for those who are above 40 and have been trying for more than four years. Marwa says, how do I conceive with irregular cycle trying for more than two years? Okay, so kind of same questions. I don't have any satisfying short answers to those questions, but I would say that if your cycle is not uh, fairly regular within that I ideal range, somewhere in there, I'd like to look at that as um, an invitation to dive deeper and learn what is going on in the balance of your cycle. And if you follow um, 
the fertility awareness method, the people who teach that method are very focused on learning about your cycle as a way to understand your overall health, not just for fertility, but just understanding what's going on in your system. There is a podcast I follow called Fertility Friday, and I actually have the book that uh, the um, host of that podcast wrote. It's called The Fifth Vital Sign, and it's it's pretty well uh, researched with references to everything that she talks about, but she's a fertility awareness um, educator, and she brings a lot of different specialists onto her podcast, and there are several episodes about irregular cycles, and if I were dealing with an irregular cycle in myself, I would probably be looking through that for ideas about where I may investigate further. And traditional medical doctors, your OB, uh, they don't usually have opinions about irregular cycles. They're more likely to say, get on the pill to regulate things. And that's not actually helping the underlying issue. This is my impression anyway. But you might work with Chinese medicine practitioners, maybe um, um, naturopaths, they tend to be more interested in trying to figure out what are the underlying causes of imbalances in, in your system. Okay, um, then I got a real general question and that'll be the last question I'm taking it before I look to see what else is in the chat. And I need to wrap up real soon because uh, I know I only have a 10 minute window left. When there's no physical or medical issues along with all the hormone tests are normal, with all body and mind meditation practices, why can't we? Why we still can't get pregnant, and what is the best way to get pregnant easily? <laughs> so basically, when it's unexplained, what can we do? And that is a big, big question. There are so many possibilities of what the factors might be. I encourage everybody to look at basic, basic lifestyle stuff like sleep. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting more sleep stress. Sometimes it's a matter of lowering stress. And my programs focus a lot on that piece. There's also an event coming up that I've been invited to uh, present at. It's called the Unexplained Infertility Summit. It's a free event over three days, May 25th through 27th. And uh, they're bringing together many different practitioners who address um, topics around uh, getting pregnant naturally. They're really trying to reach out and help people who might have been on the IVF path, but get their cycles canceled, anybody who is turning toward natural pregnancy right now. So they've brought, brought together a bunch of people who are going to be presenting on that. I will put a link to that in the description afterwards. But I think there aren't fast, quick answers. And it's really an invitation to dive deep and discover the various things that you might do to bring your system into alignment. And also, um, yeah, continue continue to listen inward, pay attention to what's going on in your body. It might turn out that there's something that medically needs to be addressed that hasn't been identified. It may turn out it's not medical at all. Maybe it was more psychological or lifestyle. So it's really an ongoing exploration to find out um, what might be the, the piece of the puzzle that, that needs to come together. Okay, so I am coming up on time. I want to make sure that everybody knows about the seven-day TTC Chill Out Challenge, which is starting on Monday. Enrollment is open now through Saturday. I close the doors a day early because I get everybody loaded up into a special email system where you're gonna get emails sent to you based on your time zone. At six or seven in the morning, you're gonna get an email letting you know that the next section is open and it's time to do your practice. And you can do it any time during the day. Everything is pre-recorded, so you don't have to show up at a certain time altogether. We do have one event at the end where we get to show up together. Afterwards, we do a little after party where we connect. Um, and celebrate all that we did during the week. But if you wanna sign up for that, do so by Saturday. Uh, please help spread the word. I just really feel like this can help so many people and I have not gone big with promotions. I'm mostly focusing on trying to create content for my YouTube channel and support the members in my program. If you go through the seven day challenge, um, you'll be introduced to a new practice each of the seven days. And it's different from what's on my YouTube channel. It's a whole new category of what we can do with meditations and self-care. Um, and then 
once you're done with that, then you have um, kind of unlocked the gate to come into my Conceive with Ease membership. If you really like this and you want to continue, you feel like it's nourishing your soul and you want to be in a community of other women who are doing this together, you can join that uh, membership program. And uh, we have more practices in there. We have live events. We have a book club. We have, um, it looks like we're going to start a cooking club. I've got this book on fertility foods cookbook that is very mind body oriented. We're going to be cooking together. And there's just a lot of fun things that we do to uh, create support, motivation, and keep things positive as we all move forward in this direction. So also in there is my 90 day egg nurturing program. So for people who have been in the program for a month, I open up the 90 day egg nurturing program so you can even dive deeper in learning about all the different things you can be doing to nourish your system. Okay. <sighs> Two minutes to go. I'm going to look real quick at the comments to make sure I'm not missing anything important. But remember what I said before, if you didn't get your questions answered, go to the Facebook group and drop your questions there. I can answer there as well. Stacy Lynn is in the 10 day program a little behind. That's fine. And with, if you're in the 10 day program and you didn't get through it, it's going to be there for you. You can come back to it anytime. Because um, if you're doing the seven day program, you want to take a little break uh, and not be doing those two at the same time. Okay, Pooja, is acupuncture mandatory for a good outcome? No, it's not mandatory. It, like everything, it depends on your, your system and what you need, and that's going to vary. I stopped acupuncture in the three months before my successful conception. I wasn't sure what was working. It was stressing me out, trying to do all these different things, and I said, I'm just going to simplify. I don't want to spend the time running around to those appointments. I'm just going to simplify. That's what worked for me not what's going to work for everybody. But what I really teach is how to tune into your intuition and figure out what's going to be helpful for you so that you can customize. For me, it was may have been creating more stress than benefit just because it was hard for me to fit those appointments in. And right now, you might not have access to appointments due to lockdown. So I don't want you to think of it as something that's mandatory. Janine, I signed up and can't wait. I can't wait either. Uh, Eugenia, high FSH, low AMH, my doctor didn't give me hope. But I disagree. Yeah. So know that there's at least one person who did it. And you know what, if you go on a forum and you post how many people got pregnant naturally with low AMH and high FSH, you're going to see a whole bunch of responses come up. So I don't know that the doctors are seeing the same information that we are, but it's very common for them to say that that's like, the door is shut on you. And Boy, it sure doesn't look that way to me. Uh, Princess Ka, what happened to the preferred order? 10 days meditation before the seven days TTC or vice versa? Either. So if you're already doing the 10-day meditation series, and let's say you didn't get through it, you can just pause and come back to it after the seven days. I just wouldn't do them at the same time, but they can go in either order. They were both kind of created to stand alone. Uh, they're, not, they're not in a series with each other. Judith, thank you for all you're doing. It's so very much appreciated. I cannot wait to start the Chill Out Challenge next week. I've been looking through the list of who is signed up. And we have a, call, I call it a tea room, where before the program starts on Monday, you come in, get prepared. I do all of the orientation to how everything works. You get to introduce yourselves. Right now, the tea room is, the tea lounge is open. People are checking in. And I'm just going to go through and let you know where um, people are from, because to me, the beauty of our modern day where we can reach all around the globe is we're so, we can be so connected. Tabby from Switzerland, Gita from Luxembourg, Zusana from Ireland, Jackie from Maryland, Pooja is in Iowa, o Ohio, uh, Judith, uh, originally from Germany, now in the UK, Hacintha, born in South Africa, uh, now in Scotland, Rose, Budapest, Monica from New Jersey, Christina from Phoenix, Arizona, Lisa Marie from Minnesota, Aggie from Ontario, Canada, Katie from, we don't know where, Virginie from Paris, France, Susanna from Sweden, Magdalena from London, 
Dragana from Serbia. What an honor, really, you know, for me to be able to host this and for you to be able to be a part of this international sisterhood of coming together and supporting each other in this positive way. I cannot wait for Monday to come. And I can't wait all this week. It's like, uh, it's so fun for me just to see the names popping up and knowing that something really special is going to happen. And if this isn't the time for you, if you don't feel like it's quite right for you, don't worry about it. I've got all the stuff on the YouTube channel that you can use after in another two weeks, I'll open up the 10 day immersion program. That's an option as well. There's lots here for everybody. Um, all right. So whew, I always start these things going, I'm going to keep it to 30 or 40 minutes. Here we are an hour and 10 minutes in. Thank you for spending this time with me. I've got one more little treat for you. One of the things that we do in the challenges, I introduce you to all of my um, instruments, my different bells and gongs that you hear in my, in my recordings. So this is a Tibetan singing bowl. You can see back there, I have a gong and then I have these meditation bell chimes, but I'm gonna play the singing bowl for you. And I'd love for you to just take a moment to connect with your own breath. Know that we have a few dozen women together right now live and lots more are gonna watch the replay. And we're all together connecting around, supporting each other and finding our best health and balance and alignment and pursuing our dreams. So I'm gonna play this bowl and just let the resonance touch you and realize that it's touching all these women around the world at the same time. Thank you for spending this time with me here today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.